Well, I, I um, drew from a very, very young age, um, loved it, made certain connections as through my childhood that just continued my uh, fascination with drawing and painting, and, and that's pretty much <laughs> traveled that course ever since. And Eric, I think in terms of your, um, you've always seemed to have had an interest in realist representation to some degree, even though I know much comes from your imagination as well. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind to say a little bit about that. Did you, well, did you um, have trouble finding training in this? In this field? Yeah, it was when I went to school um, in the in the mid late eighties. Um, the world of realism had had uh, once again been put kind of on the back burner, and it was hard to get training. There were certain schools you could go, but I chose the museum school in Boston, which was a much more um, abstract uh, of the moment type of school and I had to kind of search out for more traditional training in, the, in that school but it was good because within that context I was kind of alone and I could really get uh, a, a unique viewpoint on it um, rather than being with a, a program of teachers and students that uh, kind of produce a certain look that schools can you know can do that but I kind of found my own path within a different different group. Mm -hmm. Great. This is actually one of Eric's um, very beautiful paintings and I wonder if you would say a little bit about that since we have it on the screen. <laughs> okay well it's on the screen. It, it, that's a very new painting. It actually was just finished about a month uh, ago. Um, I've been doing a long series on uh, shirts like the one I have on um, which I really would rather not be wearing this. I don't wear them unless I'm at a, something like this. Um, and, and I just thought I would, I would pay a little attention to the leisure uh, class there and, and go delve into the polo shirt. And, and, uh, so that, that's all, it's just a new, new take on an old subject I've been doing for, for a long, long time. That's great, thank you. Jane, would you say a little bit about your beginnings? Sure. Um, I'm actually an elementary education major who married an artist who worked at a museum. And so my art education actually came. And now that I look back on it, I'm glad it was this way because I see art historians who know things from books and everything. But I actually it was the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And <clears throat> I got to go through the archives and the bins. And I, and I actually saw a whistler. I would see um, you know, a Monet, I got, you know, and then, so it was, it was the best education I could ever have. And then from that, we started, we started a gallery with, as you said, roots in, in, in a 19th, early 20th century, mostly American art, and then moved to um, Florida and to Captiva Island, where I was lucky enough to meet Mr. Rauschenberg, the one who did the painting back here. Um, so it's been a it's been a real ride, and it's it it's it's a business that you know I had some collectors one time that were thought that oh I'm going to learn everything I can about art and I'm going to collect and and I'm and then they would say like in a year I'm going to be here and I'm going to do this. You can never learn it all about it. It's it's never ending, and that's what I love about it. That's that's why I, I stay in it. So. Um. It, it's challenging every day and exciting every day too. I noticed that. Um, I think I'll just grab this one. Thank you. This one. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. Um, I noticed, Jane, that you're in your gallery. You're really dealing with a, a very diverse um, type of art. You you really do have everything from uh, very abstract works to highly realist works. Uh, pop artists, in the case of the one behind me. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you uh, you did sort of move towards um, collecting and, and sharing and representing such a diverse group of artists and why you feel that might be important. Yeah, I think it is important because as, as you were saying about this show, um, it, it is all interrelated and sometimes you don't realize that until you get further along in it and then you see that um, there there is a connection, there is a thread. But we, we just did the, an art fair in the Hamptons, and um, in my booth I had Rauschenberg, I had um, Robert Cottingham, I had Eric, um, you know, I, ha I had a great variety of things. And someone said to Eric, they said, well, how would you describe this gallery, this booth? And he didn't really know exactly what to say, but 
I would say it's what I like. I can't sell anything if I don't like it. And it, it I have to feel something for it. I've been offered artists that whose names you would know that personally I don't like. I, you know, because they maybe they produce too much or they're, um, you know, I just I just have to feel something for it. Mm -hmm. And but I think because of that where I've seen galleries come and go through the years, I've survived because I can, the person who comes in, I think my enthusiasm for that piece kind of rubs off. And I like to educate people too and teach them if they don't know. And sometimes I learn from my clients too. Sometimes they might come in and know of an artist and tell me a story about that artist or the history of that particular time. And, and so it's a, that's, that's why I love it. So these are some of the things that um, I know that you have had in the gallery, mm -hmm. such variety. Mm -hmm. This is actually a great piece. This is a, this is a Rauschenberg that he silk screen on an apron. <laughs> and he did 10 of them for his um, 10 friends and gave them as a uh, Christmas present one year. And um, that's one thing that was great about working with Rauschenberg is he was totally unpredictable. He worked on every, in every kind of medium, and not only in the art world, but in dance and performance art and all the great things he did. He was a joy to know, but, um, you know, it kind of is, it's, it, in a way it's kind of funny. You know, I can't imagine anybody cooking, you know, in that, with that on, right. but, um, but he, um, he had great insight and, and he felt that everything in the world could be art, that we all needed to look at everything and, mm -hmm. and think about it as a, as a piece of art, so. Definitely makes you look a little closer. Yeah, it yeah, does. Yeah, the unexpected. Nick, do, do you want to say a little bit yeah, about these, sure. maybe? Yeah, um, sure. Well, here, the, the one on the right is the Klaus Oldenburg that is over here. And of course, he's, as some of you may know, always takes these wonderful everyday objects and, and a lot in sculpture and, and um, a lot of them in New York City. I think there's a huge clothespin down in the fashion district and uh, quite a great sense of humor. And then, and then I was um, just telling Stephanie today that the piece on the left is, and you just talk about the art market of today and how it's changed. The, the work on the left is by Nikki de St. Fall, who in my opinion is one of the great women artists. Um, French and, and American. And um, this is a piece that I put on um, Artsy, the, a website where they vet the buyers, but they also vet the dealers, you know, the people who are interested in things. So it's a fairly exclusive site to be on. But this piece was $110,000. And I sold it last week to someone who never saw it. She knew, she knew of the piece and I had all the history and the provenance on it, which is really important when you're selling something in that price range. Sent a check, I sent her the piece, and it, I, it amazes me <laughs> sometimes that people do this, but it, it is a faster paced world today and people who know what they're doing will buy art and, you know, obviously they're buying it with confidence that I would stand behind it and everything, but it's, it's, I don't know, it, it just is an interesting way how it's changed in the 20 some years that I've, I've been in. You would have never have done that 20 some years ago. But the internet and all these things have opened up the world and make it different. Do you feel as though the relationships with collectors um, in the past maybe took a longer time to develop or? Yeah, I, th I think so because I think the thing is now today somebody can read everything about you online, they can follow you online, I can follow you on Facebook, they can see, for instance, I posted a thing with Eric and his painting out here. So they're kind of, and I think that gives a confidence to some people that, that they know, know a little bit more about you. Yeah. Eric, I wonder if you'd say a little bit about, um, you know, what, what life has been like building a career as a professional painter because it's really a, a very, um, I'd say a very unusual way to determine to move your life forward. It, it's, it's a hard road, I think. Yeah, it's <clears throat> certainly a lot harder than I had anticipated as an <laughs> idealistic, like, 15-year-old. But Here's Eric um, you just, I think the only thing that I, I did steadily was just stuck with what I 
what I love doing, and uh, I think that that has translated over the years. I really, but um, you know, the decision to become an artist is uh, is definitely a questionable one, um, <laughs> for a lot of reasons. I mean, it's uh, obviously selling your paintings is one of the most difficult things you can do. Both, you know, doing something you love so much and then letting it go and establishing a price for it and things like that. Those are obvious commercial concerns, but. Um, uh, the fact that you kind of have to stay on top of your game all the time. There isn't, you can't backslide too far. You really, if, if you get to a point where pe you're developing an audience, you find that audience sort of starts to want to see similar things or a certain thing or do that thing again, 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 again. And those kinds of audience participation, um, positive or negative, they tend to get in the back of your head. They affect the way you think in an original way. You know, you're trying to do something that will, you know, everybody looks at and sees it's, it's like some thunderstroke. Well, there's no such thing really as a, as a lightning strike in the world. But you have to keep that in the back of your head that maybe you might, you know, it's like winning the lottery. But um, I don't know, it's, it's, I, I absolutely adore it. I, I don't know if there's anything else I could do, so that's, that's another problem, <laughs> is that my skill set is fairly limited. And I've been doing it since I was two years old, so I, I really don't know what else I would do. Too, about how you, so much of it is the thinking about it, not just right. Thinking about it. The thinking and the looking, and then the second guessing and the doubting and the self hatred and the, <laughs> you know, it, it goes into a, a whole whole realm of um, introspective possibilities that I don't know if the average person who sees, you know, the, you, you, you're a carpenter or a cabinet maker, you produce a beautiful piece of furniture by design and. Um, but art is so much more wide-ranging, and it's, uh, you can't just do whatever the hell you want to do, you know. I mean, it's, uh, it, sometimes the world speaks to you and kind of pushes you along, uh, but um, I, I don't know where else. And he works so hard. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I, I have so many artists come to me. I think this is so easy, you know, and, um, and you can be talented, but... You know, I think when you look at Eric's things, there's always a little bit of a sense of humor in there. There's a funny way he's looking at the world. You know, you, you always feel like you get a little bit of insight into who he is. But, uh, but like I said, he thinks about it for a long time before he starts on a painting. And then he gets his concept. But he's up first thing in the morning, working, gets his daughter, comes in, <laughs> makes breakfast for his daughter, gets his daughter off to school, goes back and paints, maybe takes a break for dinner, and then he's painting maybe till midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And I just don't think most people have that dedication today to, to take the time to work that hard. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. Yeah. So have you two, I mean, you two, how long have you been working together now? For just about 16 years. Okay. And have you ever had that conversation where you were on a track doing a certain kind of <laughs> painting and then Jane said, well, you know, or you maybe wanted to do something a little, a little different and Jane said, well, no, yeah. no, 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 these, are, happens a lot. these are the things that are the most popular. Or fortunately, you end up getting a collaborative response uh, in the relationship of dealer and artist, which um, maybe that doesn't happen or it didn't used to happen as often when there would be a big stable. I'm fortunate that Jane works with only a few of us and, uh, and so, but she gets, she gets her, her opinion in there, which is, it's important because she acts as the, as the audience, the third person in the mm -hmm. room, which is the most important thing to think about other than what you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You want to do so much. But in the much. end, you must agree, I'm sure. <laughs> I let you yes. finally do your own thing. I to an extent. <laughs> That's great. No, because no, I it's, think it's you, you good. It's a very, very you, you good. You can't lead an artist too much. And, and in fact, the worst things that happen to us is when someone commissions something. And like we went to uh, this very, very close friend and client in Virginia, and we went down to Virginia, and they had a spot in their dining room where they wanted a piece. And they kind of explained a little bit about what they wanted in the painting and the size. And so Eric paints this beautiful painting. And we go down and they're going to have a big party for all their friends to unveil the painting. And we take it down and the guy says, I don't like the chair. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was rough. Yeah. Like an office chair. Yeah, it was like referring to his life. I thought it was being really clever. And in the end, he just wanted like a Windsor chair because he thought it would be better for the painting. And I was like, but I thought that was my decision. Anyway. Right.
Yeah. But that happens so, so, yeah. sometimes. So sometimes you know, there had to be a little give and take. Change. Sure. Put the Windsor chair. <laughs> yeah. So that's a little bit like, uh, you know, maybe what Rockwell and other illustrators would have yeah, experienced well, and that's a where they were working with an art director. That's right. Yeah. A yeah. commission is a different story. When, when someone commissions you to do a piece, it's a, it's a great thrill that they've chosen you and they like your work enough. But um, you hear them, I personally anyway, hear their voice the entire time and it definitely tempers the painting, it tempers the way that things come out because you're not operating on your own fear principle. You know, when you're making your own idea, you're so afraid that it will be misinterpreted or, or maligned or hated by the, you know, your audience that you, I think you put this extra measure of care into what you're doing. When you're commissioning something, you're so worried about this one person that you start thinking through them, or I mean, this is my own crazy, you know, all alone in the studio problem. But um, it does affect the way you, the way you you would turn out that particular piece for yeah. sure. Makes total sense. Yes, we'd love to take any questions that you might have. I see there's one right over. There. Oh, lots of questions. That's great. Sure. Please. Sure, Eric. While well, this uh, painting is up on the screen, would you sort of that second painting? Sure. Really good. Talk about abstraction and realism. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, they just, that, uh, there's an offhandedness I want to kind of, uh, to express with that tape and, and, um, and that the, was an old window that you yeah. actually had. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a, an ancient barn, um, in like a 150 year old barn and I've got tons and tons of these windows. And I was just looking at one one day and, and, and looking through the dusty panes and kind of thinking about, um, it was really about an occluded view, like just a, a I mean, a, a sort of disturbed view. And I uh, started thinking about, um, you know, people's interpretations of things and, you know, when you're looking through and you're not quite seeing the whole story. And uh, so this is, this, this turned, you know, way down the line became a painting about celebrity and about, um, uh, voyeurism and um, money and all the way those things kind of can sometimes conspire to well, make images, you put in, I mean, I can see a photograph and drawing. Mm -hmm. That's an Andy Warhol Polaroid there of Mick Jagger on the lower right. That's a, uh, a Vargas drawing up on the uh, upper right hand corner that's, um, you know, took me back to many mildewed playboy experiences. <laughs> And then uh, there's a Gil Evergreen over there, and, and I was just sort of trying to trace the evolution of, uh, and not so directly, but uh, about about um, so, uh, you know celebrity and, and concentration on things, and um, you know, and, and it, 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 it actually dovetailed pretty well with this show, so it was nice. Does that answer any problem? <laughs> what pieces are on the floor next to the painting? You discard it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, it, I, you know, it, it's, it's a, a strange process, that one, uh, determining what goes into the painting. And in the end, it's, it's part balance, it's part meaning, it's part color and interest. And then ultimately, I wanted, you know, you to take that one split second when you actually think that's a, a window, you know. Um, to, to you know, kind of snap you into reality and then experience the rest of the illusion. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Could you try to express to us the process that goes on in your head when you were choosing the colors for those t-shirts? <laughs> oh, they're mine. <laughs> and those are, the, those are the colors that they really are. They really were. They're uh, polo shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean polo shirts. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's, I, 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 I react very, very strongly to what's around me um, directly. I think you called it, fla the title's Flavor of the Week. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but so anyway, the, the shirts that I paint are mine, the, um, and the, the uh, uh, selection of them was just based on, I wanted the, the hot summer kind of uh, color selection, and that's what, that's what I came up with. <laughs> One of the things when you were talking about the painting that you did for the person who wrote the sofa, to me that was that was upsetting. Yeah. It really was. And I remember uh, hearing that Santan almost left um, writing 
uh, when he got really terrible reviews, I think it was in the New York Times. And then his answer to that was uh, somebody in the park to kill it, a hat song, you know, say, as an artist. But what it reminded me most of was um, Rand's Fountainhead. They had told him the building, how do you do that? And what goes through your mind when somebody says, I have a soap of its green. It would be great if you could change the color of the sun to green. So that, and that, I heard that. And I really had, what happened inside you? Like, what do you do? Well, it's, it's uh, first of all, the slap in the face that I didn't absolutely adore everything that I spent 150, <laughs> 200 hours on. That's the hardest part. Um, and then you have to say to yourself, this was, this was something that they asked for. They had a preconceived notion. I didn't approach it. And unfortunately, uh, I had to pay bills. You know, so, so that uh, was a hard swallow. But I will say that there, there's a point where, you know, if somebody would say, change something that he felt ethically would not be right for the piece, he would not do it. Right. Regardless of then how... This guy happens to be one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah. He so was a great person. So yeah. it wasn't a terrific example as far as that goes. It was yeah. not easier. It was just... Uh, it was okay. But it's just, it's just part of the, the world that we're in, unfortunately. You know, well, it's... I respect to be able to do what you do. Yeah, it it is. is. And, and, and he's also turned down a lot of commissions that he wouldn't do because somebody would say, I want something in it that he did, wasn't, didn't inspire him or he didn't particularly like. So. <laughs> the what? Yes, it is. Yeah. Can you describe that? Uh, yeah, it's actually, it was an addition that, that Nikki de St. Paul did. It was uh, actually out of a um, polymer um, composition, and then she hand-painted each one. So even though there's an addition of 10, each one is a little bit different because she painted on it. Um, and then that's all gold-leafed on the... Um, uh, wings uh, and silver leafed, gold leafed, and gold leafed on, on that. And um, of course, she was quite a mover and shaker in the feminist women's world. And um, you know, this is very typical of a lot of the the things that she did from that period. I can tell you, <laughs> this woman uh, the, it was the original owner. She bought it in 1986 from Gimple and Phil's Gallery in London, and she paid $10,000 for it. So she did very nice profit. <laughs> but I mean, it doesn't always happen that way. But, um, Um, well, you, you know, you know, you just don't know. I mean, it went from 10,086 to 110, you know, today. Um, but it, that's the thing. And, and artists have rise and fall. I mean, even, I mean, they know, I'm sure you know this with Rockwell, too. You know, um, he's, he's quite in vogue now, but he wasn't for a while. And, um, and so many different things can change, you know, like I wonder now with all the turmoil in Europe, is, will that affect, um, what about the British artist, you know, is this, is this going to affect the British market? We really don't know yet. There hasn't been a major auction that's come up, um, but I, there are some things that are just out of our control and it, you, you take an artist like Warhol, who is, has stayed so tremendously popular for so long. And you just, I just keep thinking, boy, there's just got to be a time when he's going to either level out or, but he just keeps going up and up and up. And then you take Rauschenberg, for example, who died in, nine, or I mean in 2008. His market has been rather stagnant since he died. But this year, there's a major retrospective on him, the Tate, which the Tate Museum's putting together. Um, then it comes to MoMA in 2017, and then it goes out to San Francisco. So we'll probably see his prices start to start to increase now. But it's um, there's just so many variables that it's um, it's it's a difficult thing. Just like you can't predict the stock market, you sure can't predict the art market either.
<laughs> no, and actually, that's, that's actually a very good point, because with the downturn, and I have worked with Eric since 2000, <clears throat> the downturn in, in uh, 2008, Eric was the only artist that I had whose prices stayed consistent, and we still had clients during that period. And my, my theory is that people were looking for quality. And if I'm going to spend my money, I'm going to put it into something that has quality. And Eric's, they see, people see and understand the time he puts into it and the quality of his work. And um, so I, I thought that really speaks well for, for him and his art. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one of the things, um, just in, to connect to what Jane just said, there is a great humanism about your work, and yet there aren't any humans. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, aside from everyone in this room, I'm not that fond of people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and, and I feel like I've, uh, people are very demanding um, in general, and I think if, if I was going to devote my life to figurative painting, um, I think that's what I'd be doing. That's, that's all you do. That becomes it. And, uh, you know, there's, you can make a landscape painting, but if you put a person in, it's a painting of a person in a landscape. I mean, the person immediately becomes the focal point. So I like to spend time in the world of what they've done, the results of humans, not so much about the people themselves. Um, and I, I just, I don't know. I see enough of people. I really do. And I think that one of the things that, that most people in the world would benefit by and it's not going up on a hill and painting for several hours, but to go and sit and look at something for two or three hours, just look at one thing for two or three hours, I guarantee you no one in this room's ever done it. It's a very hard thing to do, but um, it's worth it. It's worth it because you just, you just realize what a big place this is, what a small part, we, we could be a so much smaller part of it, I mean, or so much more of a cohesive part of it and and really what you notice is the noise in the background and there's building something and this constantly changed not that that's bad or wrong it's just that if you take time to look at the other thing you can notice that that's worth painting too and you can leave the the guy out and, and just one other observation too on because who's not bob cottingham who's not here today but <clears throat> is, who's the photo realist working from the photographs as opposed to eric who he calls himself an eyeball realist. And I think there's a, it, there's, it's not, not like there's a right or a wrong in the art world, but I think it's fascinating to see the difference um, between the two painters and the, and the way, and it, it's a shame that Bob can't be here today to, to uh, tell you his, his process, but uh, not unlike Eric's process where he's actually staring at the actual object for hours and um, or a, a landscape or whatever you know Bob's doing doing it through a photographic process and um, it's uh, I, and I and I love I love them both and I love the way they both work but it, I, I um, it's interesting like I said there's no right or wrong to it it's just the way it is and how they've developed Interpretation. yeah thank you yeah definitely Well, I think what attracted me to Edward Hopper, and it was when I was about, I think, 15 years old, there was a um, Charles Kuralt special on him on CBS Sunday morning. And, um, you know, I, I still get goosebumps thinking about it because I remember the first three or four paintings. I had no idea who this guy was, but I just felt like I could, I understood him. And I, it was approachable. It was believable. It was, it was not overwhelmingly technical to the point where you were kind of put off by it. It had a... And for me, as someone who drew and was, was thinking about being an artist pretty hard, it seemed like a possibility, like uh, that he touched on something or, 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 or expressed things in a way that was, you know, believable on all levels, you know. So I think that's where I love Dead. Mm -hmm. Can you take us through your process sort of from beginning to end of, of, of how a painting happens? I mean, Raffle had a complex process, but every stage was thought out very carefully. Are, mm -hmm. you, are you like that too? 
I don't think I'm probably as technically uh, rigorous as, as Norman Rockwell was. He had a, a real reason to be very, very consistent because he was producing these illustrations that were known nationally. I have more of a fly by the seat of the pants approach to painting, and um, I had four, have four children, uh, fabulous kids that took a lot of my time, and I, I made sure that I was home and with them. But uh, during that time, I had to develop quick ways to use time um, and to react to when interruptions take over, which is almost constant. So you have to have other things ready to do. So um, my process generally goes from, uh, you know, if I have seen a landscape that I, that I really liked, I try to remember that and get to it before I forget. And, um, and the same is true with, with, with still imagery. I mean, I, I see things or think of things on the back of my eyelids. I try to hold on to that basic composition that I've looked at and try to recreate it and then and, and, and go from there. And sometimes it works and oftentimes it doesn't. So, so is there a, a drawing process or do you go straight to canvas? I go. Uh, another issue with having the kids is, you know, preparatory drawings were one of the things that between diaper changes and getting through a meal or whatever. And I was Mr. Mom at home for eight years, so I know all about that. And I'll challenge anybody to diaper changing. But um, uh, where where I got off subject? Where, what was the what was the question there? <laughs> well, I, you, you were you were sort of answering. Do you it, spend, yeah. Pencil drawing. Do you draw right. No. So anyway, yeah, I, d I didn't really have time for preparatory drawings. So all of my drawings pretty much are under every painting. There's a very uh, decent brush drawing of 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 any any subject. It's, you know, basic line contour drawing mm -hmm. under the painting. One of the things I think is so wonderful about Eric is, is the way he captures light. And this is like a perfect example of, you know, the subtle shadows, the beautiful light. And that really is, you know, I mean, that is the real, I mean, he'll go back the same time each day pretty much if he's working on a piece like this. To kind of, at the same time of the year, you know, to try to capture it day after day after day while he's still got in, getting the same light and maybe within a two-hour, what, a two-hour period or something. Yeah, right. And, then, um, and I, you can just, again, you can just tell that difference at that. That's, his paintings light up even when you don't have any light on them, and that's because of that world that he works in. So would you then be working on several things at once? To yeah. Sort of accommodate the changing light? Right, and so I'll have a full day's work, and then um, when I get tired of working in the <laughs> studio, I'll go out and paint landscape for a few weeks or months, and tired of that, come back in, and that they just sort of feed themselves. There's a whole different mindset to landscape painting. You have to be uh, fast and, and much looser, um, and you, you really have to worry about weather and, and getting things down very quickly because you know things change, and then it's still life, it's all controlled, and you sit and you or stand and, and, and look for long periods of time. So uh, it, it's nice that they work off of each other to give me a full calendar. <laughs> no, you know what happens in my, I have, I have this old barn, like I said, and uh, the problem I have is not, is not rotting, it's, it's vermin. <laughs> <laughs> the mice, I mean, th th they were there centuries before I was. Their highways are established like in Lincoln's time. So there's no way I can possibly uh, stop them. So I just have to have these pedestals that are away from walls and from jumping spots where they can, you know, jump and, and it's really hideous, but, Sometimes you know. Sometimes they'll call the next day and say, oh my gosh, I went out and ate the pears. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's and they'll be, and they will eat the whole thing and there's just these little kind of like jeering chunks of skin and, <laughs> and they're droppings everywhere to say like, hey buddy, you think you're so smart? <laughs> Try painting this. <laughs> Um, some of us are quite a bit older than you, and I remember distinctly in the 60s when Nikki the same father was just, and yes. with her husband or boyfriend, Philippe, so I forget what it was, right. they were just sensational. And it was a period of a lot of bitterness. Yes. Um, and very big divisions over the war in Vietnam and stuff like that, women especially. Yeah. I remember the exact year the birth control pill came <laughs> But it affected the arts. I remember very bitter things in the Times Magazine and things like that about what is art and art is art days and all this other crap. Do you think these times with these huge 
angers now will affect the art market and your work? Interesting. Well, I think I think any upheaval affects the art market. Let's face it, the art market is uh, on the um, high end of things as far as, uh, and probably on the low end as far as uh, survival importance. So I think when big things go wrong, people take a powder for a little while. But um, and and I think that that'll happen. That happens to any anybody who's selling in this environment. It's it's hard to to keep up with that. And then I think this. If you're paying attention, it creeps into your work somehow. There's no question. I mean, it, it hasn't. I, I couldn't paint after 911 for months. It was just seemed so ridiculous an activity. It was so much horror in your face. You couldn't really, you know, it, it seemed so selfish. So I think on that emotional level, um, you can go two ways. You can either react strongly, as a lot of the post World War II painters did, and that's what abstract expressionism was born from. Um, or you can, you know, reflect and try to try to comment later. Uh, someone just brought me an, a Norman Rockwell print um, that Rockwell had signed for him <clears throat> from the, I think it was 1967, maybe he did the New Kids in the Neighborhood, which you, they have the painting around here, and he brought it in and you know, I, I, I started looking at it and I thought, wow, it's, it, it has, the times really haven't change too much, you know. Um, so interesting, but I, I like what you're saying, and I, I, I think it does, you know, it does create, has to create some kind of change in artists. Um. There's a, a quote in the other room, just to your point, Lynn, I'd, I'd like to introduce you to Bob Horvath and Lynn Horvath, Bob is our board chairman, so we're glad you're here. <laughs> dissatisfaction with the way the world was at the time, to some degree, so, um, you know, most, most certainly, uh, it'll be interesting to see what art actually comes from all of this. Yeah. So, oh, Bob? Would you encourage your collectors to educate themselves, not only in what they're collecting, but in all the peripherals around it? In other words, art, period. Be interested in what you collect, the whole field. Yeah, I think I think that's important. And you know, the other thing, as I said, what I I sell what I like. That's what I say. There again, there's no right or wrong. People like, oh, am I making a mistake buying this? If you like that piece, and you you should research, you should do some due diligence because everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to find that new emerging artist that no one's found, and it's going to be worth millions of dollars. You know, don't go into it thinking that. Maybe that'll happen, you know, maybe you'll be lucky, but I think you do your due diligence, you should find out, and you want to, you know, you want to get an artist that you feel has some substance to them, and it, as far as maybe a little education, or they've shown somewhere, or, or but if you just like it, and you enjoy that piece every day, I, I have one of my best clients um, for years was a, a, a cardiovascular surgeon, and he had a very tough tough life, you know, losing people and, and the stress every day of, of that he went through. And he said, my greatest joy was to come home every night, plop down on my sofa, and look at the art around me. And he said, it just calmed me, it made me happy. And, you know, you get, it can't get any better than that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be complicated. It really doesn't. A well cared for piece of art will last for a thousand years with that with ease. Well, and that's the other thing. It's a nice legacy too. You know, I, I, there's nothing. I, I mean, I love to get a piece of art that <laughs> the kids don't want, but I also think it's wonderful when the children do want uh, want it. And then you feel like it's, you know, that's something that maybe your mother loved and your grandmother loved and your great grandmother loved. What it's a great, a great commodity. Yeah. You do. Yeah. Oh, certainly. I mean, in many, many, many cases of the, totally the opposite happening, but I think, um, you know, uh, in, in the right situation, obviously the museums of the world are filled with seven, eight, nine hundred year old paintings. 
Um, and I, I think that that will outlast a lot of technology. And obviously, we're going to develop, and eventually, we're just going to be able to snap our fingers and go to Pluto or whatever. But you know, for the time being, I, I, I think payments are nice that they, you know, they can keep on giving for that long, long after a plug is, you know, stopped being relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, follow up on the market, you know, price and the price of art. Um, what I'm wondering about, and clearly you need a certain level of wealth to be able to buy art. So I'm wondering from that point of view as an artist, how does it affect you to know that, you know, you'll be painting if you want to sell it. I'm not talking about a man selling things, I'm pretty love, but <laughs> anyway, but to sell it, you know you're, you're painting for a certain level of class and wealth. And does, how does that affect Well, I, I think the fact that I can't f afford my own artwork <laughs> is, is a brutal commentary on the world in general. It's not really fair. But uh, the same is true for many industries. So I, I just feel like um, if, uh, if you're fortunate enough to, to watch your prices escalate, then you need to ride it. But re remember that they can just as quickly de-escalate. Um, if you fall out of favor or if your work falls off or your quality becomes suspect. So um, I don't know if that answers the question. But, but, it's but also, I, I don't think that Eric paints, when he's doing a painting, I don't think you think about no, the, the selling process the, of the it. Price, in fact, no. it's like, you know, get, finish it and give it to me, you know, because it's yeah. like a, taking his child from him, you know. So he doesn't, re I mean, yes, he likes the check when it comes, but I don't think that where a lot of artists put things out, you know, and, and thinking, oh boy, I'm going to get rich. I don't think that was, is, is the way. No. no. that wasn't quite my point. I think it's more that you know that, I mean, if you reach a certain level I see, that yeah. you have a price for your artwork, you know only a certain price. I know. You will be able to afford it to begin with. So you try to get prints going, I guess, yeah. is the <laughs> next thing. I don't know what else to do. I mean, it, there's, there's nothing you can really other than producing a less quality, lower priced version of what you've already done, which I think is, it's, you know, if people try that, it doesn't work. It, you just have to just ride whatever is given to you. And uh, it, it's, it, it, I would love to own some of my own paintings. There's some of them I would buy back in a heartbeat. But I also love the fact that they're out there doing my bidding for me, which they always will be, even and long after I'm dead. And not the way he paints. He's not that prolific. I mean, it's, you know, some artists can do a painting in a day where Eric takes weeks or sometimes months, you know, to paint one painting. So, um, again, that the supply and the demand thing, you know, is, as he's gotten more popular and more people want his work, and there's not that much of it. Many times we have somebody waiting for the piece even before he's finished it, which is a great, a great place to, to be in. Yeah. Jane, could you uh, describe how, how do you think Eric works, Eric's art reflects our time period? Oh, good question. Um, I, right, right. It's interesting because, as, as I said, I had my background was in 19th, early 20th century art, and then I moved to Rauschenberg and Lichtenstein and these artists. And I think the thing I loved about Eric is I've always felt like he's got a, a foot in that 19th century, in Edward Hopper and that world, but he's also got his foot in the 20th century. And I think the reason... Eric's work will will survive, and I don't I don't I, I don't think anybody else paints like Eric. I mean, he I tell him this all the time. He has a very unique style, and that's very hard to find today. But I think it is because that that combination of the older world, and yet in a contemporary, but putting it into a contemporary feel is why he's he's special. And um, I, I think he's a you know, I, I have a lot of artists that want to work with me, and um, I, I actually saw um, Eric's first painting in, um, and we'll brag a little bit here, uh, Meryl Streep is a friend of mine and her husband Don Gummer, and I saw one of Eric's paintings in about 1999 in Don and Meryl's house, and I, I said, who is this artist? I just loved it. And they said, oh, it's Eric Forsman, you, you know, you should meet him. And I, so I went and sought him out, where most of the times it's the artists coming to me, 
you know, looking for representation. But I, I think it's that, um, I just, I just think he has a way of looking at the world. There's always a little, kind of a little bit of sense of humor in, a, in some of his things. Um, and, um, but he really looks at the world and he, and he does, he doesn't venture too far from his own world. He, f he finds it right there and, and paints it right there. Yeah. I find this discussion very fascinating. I've been a fellow since another office scene for about 20 years, and my whole life has been an artist and an art educator and so forth. And one thing we never discussed was price. Yes. Uh, very good. How many lectures I've been to in the past 20 years, and before, and we never discussed it. I know, and it's it. it uh, no, but I and I and I think it's very important and I wish the art schools would have dealers come and gallerists come in and talk to to people who want to go into the that world about that very thing. My theory has always been as a as a as a young artist or an artist who's just starting out is to keep your prices very very reasonable. Get them out there because, and in fact, I think the painting that I saw at Donna Merrill's, they maybe paid eight hundred dollars for it, thousand. Oh, well, it was more than that, sir. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but it was. It wouldn't have been over uh, maybe a thousand. It was two thousand. Okay, so two thousand. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but today that painting would, you know, you'd be adding zeros to that painting. But, but the thing is, I think if you can make your prices reasonable and you get them out in people's homes and somebody else sees it and then somebody else talks about it, and then you can have that rise. So many young people or artists starting out think so highly of themselves that they think, well, I can paint, you know, as good as Perlman, and I'm going to, you know, ask that price for it. And, you know, it just doesn't work that way. I do remember back in the uh, late 50s, I think the first painting was sold for a million dollars, the Rembrandt. And uh, it was shocked the art world. Yes. Made the New York Times, and we did discuss it mm -hmm. in our, our, uh, our program at school. But uh, money... Oh yes, a Remington at that time was five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. In the late forties, didn't have five thousand so dollars. <laughs> yeah. Didn't make that in a year. But uh, today, what do they go for? Fifteen million, yeah. maybe more. Who knows? I know. It, this whole discussion on, on, on money is very, very interesting. Well, it is, and, and it, it's a funny story because Rauschenberg used to talk about this a lot when they were all starting out, and they were all at the Cedar Bar in New York City or wherever, and drinking and having a good time, and de Kooning and and Lichtenstein and John Chamberlain and all of them, and and nobody had any money, and 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 they were all great friends, and they were in Jasper Johns, and they were all sharing their stories and having a great time, and then. Jackson Pollock's painting goes through auction and brings a million dollars. That was one of the first contemporary things to bring a lot of money. And he said, really, from that day on, it what no, nothing ever stayed the same because they didn't they weren't doing it because of money necessarily. But all of a sudden, it became about money, and then they became popular. And as soon as the money came into it, and it, and, and and in a way, as long as I've been in this, I don't like it. I really don't. I liked it when, like we were talking about, that the early collectors bought things just because they loved it. They didn't have any idea it would increase. But once that, once the money got involved from the artist's point and from the dealer's point, it, it definitely has changed the art world, and I don't think for the better. I know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're getting there. <laughs> We're getting back to that spot. Oh, I think so many galleries have gone out of business it's, it's yeah, through the big recession, good. tons and tons of them. And um, I, I foresee a time when ateliers and 
uh, there'll be much more direct sales. I think the internet is going to facilitate that. It's happening now. Um, Self-sales has always had a certain um, negative uh, kind of connotation, but I think the market is going to demand. It's going to happen. Yeah. I just wonder, how do you go from the artist selling the low price, you know, pictures and you can see them out there, one of the different art shows and stuff, and then you get them out there, but you find that something catches, Everybody wants the same picture or some variation of the same picture. Then all of a sudden you become a star, prices go way up, but now you're stuck with, you know, do I just keep doing the same thing I've been doing, which right. is old, or do I go with the, you know, the bigger prices and yeah. find like something which is more unique? Or? It's really, that's a very hard question, and it's a, it's a tightrope because you have to, you have to supply all these different wants, and the, you know, the, the, hopefully, the biggest want is the want inside of you that makes you want to do more really good art. You do something different. But do you do something that. different, and everybody hates it, and, and you know, you're forced to at that you're at that crossroads again. Do you do you you know serve the public and and your stomach and your your mortgage, or do you uh, stand on principle and and get thin? Um, you know. Oh, I think the church was the major acquirer and had a considerable influence. If you look at five or six hundred years of art history, the subjects are largely religious, and I think that's why they were they paid. They paid. There weren't a lot of private collectors. Yes. Question: uh, You mentioned things are sometimes in vogue and you go out of vogue. It used to be that in England it was the Royal Academy that set what was in vogue, and we had similar organizations like that in France and Germany. Is that is there anything like that now, or is it all just Facebook? <laughs> no, there's nothing like that now. And that's part of the, you know, abstract expressionism and other free-thinking kind of explosive movements. They, they just blew all of that out of the water. Now, you could try to return to that, uh, but you, you, would, you would have to stanch the flow of, of human creativity. I mean, at the time that there was an academic standard, everybody painted alike, you know, and, and that, that, that it did two things. It, it constricted the market but it also allowed only a certain amount of artists to be good enough to be considered to be in the academy. So other artists who, who might have had a, like to say today, be more of an expressionist and less of a realist, they wouldn't fit into the academy. So that expressionism or that, that, that method of expression would be disregarded. And I don't think that that can happen anymore. I think our, our world hopefully has become so wide ranging in its opinions and, and, uh, and influences that, that um, you know, I don't think we'll ever have another academic. Maybe, you know, maybe Trump comes into office and says we can only paint one way. I don't know. I can see that happening. Yes. Yes, she was. Yeah. Yeah. They were. <laughs> I know, and the, and those things are bringing huge money now. Huge money. He was at Roy Lichtenstein, one of the brilliant merchandisers of the 20th century art. He really understood how, I mean, he appropriated most of his imagery, but then he was able to regurgitate it into so many different forms that, uh, you know, he was, he was really quite. And there's an instance, too, when we talk about the market. Um, when Roy died in the late 90s, um, and I, I knew him a little, but I know his wife, his widow, quite well. Um, a lot of times when these artists die that, that had some fame and fortune, the, they're left with a lot of art, and they're not really certain what to do with it, and then that puts in uncertainty into the market. But the, the Liechtenstein Foundation is one of the strongest foundations, and they hired really, really strong people to head it up, and, and almost instantly, and they, they just let a few things out at a time, and they would bring, you know, 
10 million, 14 million, 20 million. You know, I think the last something was 40 million recently that just sold, and they've been very smart on how they've handled his his career and his legacy, and it's um it, it's a good good thing to be to know. And I mean, I, I you probably I mean I don't know all the story on the Rockwell thing, but I'm sure that's something that everyone goes through when a great artist dies. One of the things that I've observed is that it really does take a, an engine to keep an artist's legacy alive. And I think the galleries, uh, such as, as, as Jane is working, uh, really does that. Museums do that. Uh, we travel Norman Rockwell's work pretty consistently because we know that we need to educate the next generation of appreciator. And so not everyone's going to come to Stockbridge, and we need to get um, his work out so that it remains relevant. And I think the galleries really serve a similar purpose uh, in keeping an artist relevant and alive. Any further questions? Yes. Um, I, I don't know. I actually saw a few of Nikki's on um, recently on on um, somewhere on the internet, but I I, th I know that the. Um, the, the, some of the things that, that Lichtenstein did, even like, um, there's like paper plates that he silk screened. I mean, a paper plate. And they're bringing like $700, $800 just for that one plate. And cups that he did, you know, limited editions of cups are in the thousands. And, uh, and, and jewelry, you know, he made jewelry. Calder's another one who made jewelry. And now it's, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars people are paying for this. Where, and, you know, at the time they just did it as like gifts for, for friends or whatever. But, um, but when, you're, when your work gets to be so expensive and somebody just wants to own something, by that artist, then these things happen. In St. Petersburg, yeah. Talk about I know. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of the most plagiarized artists in history. Yeah. He had a very unscrupulous uh, manager in the late 50s and into the 60s, and just there's millions and millions of bad etchings out there. Maybe you can get an engine like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as a dealer, how are you coping with all the uh, forgeries? Well, you have to, you have to be very very careful, and 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 the only thing you can do, I mean, and hey, museums are fooled. Some of the great collectors are fooled. Everybody can be fooled. There's no, there's no doubt about it. But what my advantage is that I get it right. You know, I know the person, I know their history, or I know somebody who knows them, and. I, I go to their home, I see it, you know, so I, I can really sell it with a lot more confidence than somebody who just would walk into my gallery and say, here, this is, this is what I want to sell. It's kind of scary, though. It's very scary. Mm -hmm. And we have our wonderful curator, so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We all have a story. <laughs> um, just in closing, are there some things that you're kind of looking forward to right now? Um, yes, actually, and it ties into Air Force. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> no. nice. No, we have, we're really honored. I was telling you earlier today, there's a wonderful, um, my gallery was in Naples, Florida for, for years. And there's a wonderful, um, the Naples Wine Festival down there where they, um, people fly in from all over the world and they, they raise literally 14, 10 to 14 million dollars in a night at these auctions. And 100% of the money goes right into Naples, Florida, which is a hugely wealthy community, um, has a lot of poverty and it has migrant workers and... Yeah, yeah. I mean, behind the, you know, all the mansions are uh, it's a lot of a lot of people hurting, and so this all these wealthy people down there started this auction, and um, they have, um, and a hundred percent of this money goes to help these kids down there, and they've just done amazing things with it, and um, this year they've asked Eric to be the um, featured artist for it, and he's actually working on the painting. Right now, yeah. <laughs> That's why when you said, do I have any input or do we have input, I was just like five hours ago, I was, we were arguing about this. So I'm trying but, to come up with something that will raise a tremendous amount of money that everybody loves and it's you know, too really difficult. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's quite an honor and, um, and I'm very excited about that. And, right. anything. and then the grand, grand opening of the Kent Gallery yes, yes. at Good Fine Art in Kent, August 20th, and then... Uh,
and then I'll have a show in October, so I remember who's here. You'll all be there, right? <laughs> Thank you both so much for a wonderful oh, thank evening. You. Thank you.